my message this morning is to try to rescue you from fruitless giving, to give without a blessing from God, and to fill your life with blessing if you can give willingly and not by constraint. So let's bow in silent prayer and ask the Lord to truly impress on our own heart the message of this morning. All right, we're done skiing down this hill, so let's go uh, to the thought of giving willingly, not by constraint. By way of introduction, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man, and I wanted to uh, apologize, those of you who are at the uh, funeral, my wife pointed out to me right afterwards that I said that, uh, that Christ was creating Moses in the Garden of Eden, and I'm not sure where Moses came into that. Uh, I hope all of, uh, everybody understood I was talking about Adam, but I said Moses. I went back and looked at it uh, last night to make sure. Yeah, I said that all right. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. We've talked about that being by purpose. Not grudgingly, then also not of necessity. We want to talk about that this morning. For God loveth a cheerful giver. The implication is that if you're giving out of necessity, you are not giving as a cheerful giver. Now this word, necessity, is Strong's uh, Exhaustive Concordance, number 318, ana, anakke. And uh, the ana part is uh, the word that means again or from above, but uh, the k is of, of duty. So it means, here's the, the full meaning, of necessity caused by imposed circumstances. So it is what you must do under the circumstances you live in. Or it could be just called the law of duty. This is not optional, this word. This means it's a law and your duty to do it. Or maybe it's just your custom, maybe it's the argument, Maybe it's calamity, something that's uh, expressing need, distress, or straits. This is the word straight, meaning like the Straits of Gibraltar, where something is narrow and the boats have to be very careful to uh, wait, get through without wrecking. Let me take you a little further into other verses with this word, just two other verses. But I, I think you begin to see how the word, uh, translated necessity here in giving, um, is used in Luke 21, 23. But woe unto them that are with child, he's talking about during the tribulation period, and to them that give suck, they are ready to have a baby or they're uh, giving uh, uh, food to the, the little nursing babies in those days. For there shall be great distress. And that is the distress in the sense of need, where people need things but they don't have it in the land and wrath upon this people, this people Israel. So the word spoken of here, don't give by necessity, means don't give with great distress, with great sense of need, you see. Then again, 1 Corinthians 9, 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to, to glory of, to boast about, for necessity or need is laid upon me. He says, I'm doing this because I have to. Giving the gospel out is not something that we should consider optional. If somehow the cure for cancer got beamed into your brain during a dream one night and you woke up saying, I know how to cure cancer. And then you just walked around the rest of the day saying, ha, 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 I know how to cure cancer. And you didn't do anything about it. You didn't give it to anybody. You didn't share it with anybody. Um, how horrible would that be, you see? And we have the gospel. That's what he's saying. I have the gospel. I have the cure for eternal death. So necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. 
And so the necessity is the idea here. Now, not using the same word, but other verses with this same thought, we find that uh, we ought to be motivated by blessing, not law. If you give out of a sense of duty, a give out of a sense of law that I'm told to give, so I have to do it, then you're not getting the blessing. Look at Proverbs 11.25. The liberal soul, and the Hebrew here is the soul of blessing, the one who would like to bless. Uh, this is the giving soul. Shall be made fat, which is prosperous, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. You get to participate in the blessings of your giving. Proverbs 22.9. He that hath a bountiful eye, and Hebrew is good of eye. This is not... The opposite is covetousness, having the evil eye. I want it, I want it, I want it. I'm not happy if somebody else has it and I don't have it. But this would be the bountiful eye, the good of eye, shall be blessed for he giveth of his bread to the poor. I think I surprised a lady, pulled up one early one uh, Wednesday morning at the uh, uh, Hardee's down by the school where I pick up my breakfast sandwich and my glass of tea for the day. And uh, she was a, a new young lady there that I hadn't seen before. And she says, how are you this morning? I said, I'm fine. And you're, you're that kind lady that feeds the poor. <laughs> and she went, oh, I guess I am. <laughs> Here's the giving of his bread to the poor. She didn't really give it to me. But I had to pay for it. But I was happy for it. This is the attitude. You're, you're being blessed by giving. God sees to that. Secondly, Rest in the fact that God takes care of you. What about me? I have to have this money for myself. What if something happens? See, Just reading uh, or hearing of uh, uh, Shelley Hamilton's uh, sister's house where they were living burned down. And how sad is that? But God is going to take care. Now, sometimes God takes care of us in this life. And we've, my wife and I have seen this over and over again. Luke 6, 38, give, you handing it out, and it shall be given unto you. How will it be given to you? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. <laughs> That's a lot, isn't it? That's as much and more than fits in the cup. Shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet, the same measure that you meet out, with all it shall be measured to you again. One man said, I give uh, bountifully to the Lord, and he gives more bountifully to me. He says, I keep shoveling it out, and he keeps shoveling it in, but he has a bigger shovel. And I like that idea. So sometimes in this life, and uh, if you've been saved for a while, and you've had uh, hard times and difficult times, my wife and I were... What were we talking about? Oh, Samuel's crash, I guess. His first car. Um, we were praying about that in Sunday school. Uh, and she was counting over. We, we've never had a lot of money to go buy a car. And she was counting up the cars we've had. She was up into the 20s. So, uh, it sounds like we lived a high life there. But you know, the reason we had to have the next car was because the the old one that we were driving gave up on us. But when we don't get a lot in this life, we are told that sometimes we're going to get it in the life to come. Luke 14, 12 to 14. Then said he, Jesus also unto him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they bid thee again. Don't give so that they will give to you. Don't have that as your motive. And a recompense be made to thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed. These are the people who can't work. The lame and the blind. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot rep recompense thee. You're giving to people that can't give back. And so he says, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. 
when you give to where you can't get it back here, God says, I'll take care of you then. All right, that's all introduction. So let me just quickly go through the rest of this. Understanding God's limit to giving by constraint. God says, don't give by constraint. We've looked at what it means, the idea of necessity, of need, think I have to do it. Now, what this really means, and uh, Brother Gary Kaiser was always, uh, whenever I would speak on these things, he said, yeah, he says, I always grind under the preacher that tells me I'm supposed to give a tithe. Then he goes to the Old Testament to preach it. He says, he says what other part of the law are, are you going to put on me, see? Are you going to put me under uh, animal sacrifice now and so on? Because it's clearly an Old Testament concept, you see. So when a preacher puts you under the law saying that you have to give and give a certain amount, you tell him that he's fighting against getting a blessing. Well, maybe you don't want to tell him. <laughs> Send him an anonymous note or something. But anyway... Um, He's restricting the blessing. Living under law is constraint. Living under law is constraint. This is, you don't have the choice in this thing. It's a law, you see. So when a law commands you to do something, rebellion builds and you ask, what if I don't want to? And now you're giving, but maybe I don't want to do that. When a law commands you to do something, rebellion builds and you ask, why not? It says, don't do it. Why not? Romans 7, 14 to 16. For we know that the law is spiritual. God gave it. God's a spiritual being. God is trying to make it, things better for us, so he gave us the law. But I, the apostle says, am carnal. I'm fleshly, sold under sin. I approach the spiritual law of, of God with a sinful attitude. For that which I do... I allow not. I know not. He says, I am doing things that I don't want to do. I'm not sure who's doing it then, but I don't want to do it, but I do it. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. You know, there's a key in this that says, for the Christian who falls again and again over a certain sin, please recognize that it's not really you doing it. You as a saved person, it's not you doing it. It is the old you, the unsaved you. Uh, how can I make it sound ugly? The, 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 the you that was dead and rotting and that dead body said, I like that feeling of rotting. I like that taste of worms in my mouth. And so let's do it again. And this is, this is what's putting you into this, you see. He says, I want to do what's right. But this old flesh is saying, go back. Go back to the rottenness. God is not satisfied with half-hearted attempts at obedience. How much off the mathematics answer do you have to be before it's wrong? <laughs> if, if it's just slightly off, it's wrong. It can be right or it can just be off by a smidgen. God's not satisfied with half-hearted attempts at obedience. Let me take you to Psalm 119, 2, 10, and 34. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. The testimonies are the Old Testament uh, life stories. And they did what was right, and they got blessed, and they did what was wrong, and they got it in the, in the ear. And that seek him with the whole heart. Full dedication. 10, with my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. And then 34, give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with 
my whole heart. And this is when God blesses. A half-hearted attempt, I'll just kind of aim in about the right direction. You're going to get lost. You're on the wrong path. Again, God is not satisfied with incomplete attempts at obedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Deuteronomy 27, 60, uh, 26a. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. This is why the law is so condemning. Because we have to do it all or we're a sinner. Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law. Are you trying to get saved by law keeping? Is that what you're doing? Let's go on to Galatians. Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. <laughs> We're finding out how to do this. There we go. Are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. James perhaps is the clearest here. James 2.10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Look, if you have this chain draped from side to side up here. You say, I, I, I didn't break the chain. I just broke one link. I got news for you. That's all it takes. One link and the thing falls apart. He says, the law is being perfect like God. So, if you're under the law, this is necessity. This is need. Again, God's law demands some actions and forbids other actions. It's not try to do it, you know. It's just do it or don't do it. See? Here's an example. Genesis 2, 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. This is the Hebrew phrase, Eating thou shalt eat. <laughs> so what were they supposed to eat? Uh, not meat, by the way, in the beginning. Not until after the flood. But also there was something not to eat. Genesis 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For, here's the warning, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And here, instead of eating, you shall eat. It's dying, you shall die. Again, God demands some attitudes, not just actions, and forbids others. Deuteronomy 10, 20. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him shalt thou serve. Did I mess this up back there? No. Yeah, okay. They're struggling to find out where I am in this thing. Deuteronomy 10, 20. There we go, up there at the top. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him thou shalt cleave and swear by his name. This is what we should do. Matthew 4.10 then said Jesus unto him, the devil, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. Exodus 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor thy manservant, nor maidservant, nor his ox, or his ass, donkey, anything that is thy neighbor's. Here's the things you don't have the attitude of covetousness. In Deuteronomy 6, 14, you shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are around about you. So the attitudes of worship, the attitudes of worshiping whatever you want, he says this is absolutely wrong. Again, all humans fall short of God's glory. You may have great aspirations, you might have great New Year's resolutions, but you in yourself cannot do all that God said. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the law cannot be your standard for giving because you will never please God. You'll never, come, uh, you'll never fulfill it. Again, none are considered righteous before God, not even one. You almost hear this saying, what do you mean? Nobody? Not even one. That's right. Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Again, living in disobedience 
removes you from God who is light and life and love. You don't want to be removed from that. Living in disobedience removes you from the God who is light and life and love. 1 John 1, 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You go away from God, you're going away from the light, the truth, the knowledge of, of what's right. John 6, 33. For the bread of, uh, bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So he's light, he's life, and love, 1 John 4, 8 and 16. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 16, we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, God in him. So what happens if you reject God? 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. These people will be punished with everlasting destruction, notice, from the presence of the Lord. You are seeking his face, you're seeking to please him, but you will be punished away from him and from the glory of his power. You're just out of it. And this leaves you in darkness and death and despair. Matthew 8, 11 to 12a, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west, talking about Gentiles, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But they get to be there with God. But the children of the kingdom Israel shall be cast into outer darkness. Darkness is away from God who is light. Revelation 20 verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Instead of the life of God, you're given death. Revelation 21 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And despair, we find it in Matthew 8, 12b, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the grinding of the teeth when you're in great pain. Despair. So, this is not ideal to say, I, I, the Bible says give a tenth, I have to give a tenth. You are now giving out of necessity and this is not the good path to be on because if you just ruin one little part even your giving a tenth is no good so the second thing we want to notice is that giving living under grace is willingly give willingly not under constraint uh, not out of necessity Living under grace is willingly. So God, God sent his son as our substitute, Romans 5, 6, and 8. When we were yet without strength, unsaved, in due time or according to the time, Christ died for the ungodly in their place. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We owed a death that he paid. He gave us the life that we could not gain. This, Christ's being given, is in, uh, initiated the new covenant. We were explaining that during the Sunday school hour. Matthew 26, 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Substitution, his blood instead of ours. Hebrews 9.15, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, of the New Covenant, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions were made under the First Testament, that they were, uh, that which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So he initiated the New Covenant, the promise of forgiveness of sins came by his death. Again, when you experience the new birth, when you get saved, when you trust Christ as Savior, you experience the new birth, you are delivered from the law. You're not required to obey the law that says you have to give a tenth. Romans 6, 14 and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For you are not under the law. Under is 
is a picture of the chain of command. You see, you're not under the command of sin anymore. But you are under grace. But under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. He says, no, that's just opposite of what we ought to do. Again, self-righteousness was replaced with God-righteousness. Romans 3, 21, 22. He, he gives us the principle. But now the righteousness of God without the law. Righteous, not law-keeping kind of righteousness. My personal righteousness being better and better. No, this is the God-righteousness without law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Old Testament testified this time would come, and here it is. Even the righteousness of God, well, how do you get it? Which is by faith of Jesus Christ. The only way to get this is by faith and the faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Uh, you can be, you know, super handsome like I am, or ugly like those ushers. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the thing is, you know, this is all uh, incidental stuff. God doesn't see that difference. Romans 10, 3, I, I give this to you a lot. It makes it such a clear difference. For they, the unsaved Jews, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, this is the righteousness you get by law-keeping, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They didn't bow in quiet, humble faith. They rose in proud, I do things better than you do. Again, the believer's motivation for pleasing God is not law, but love. We are not under a law relationship with God. We are under a love relationship. 1 Timothy 1.9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. I'm not supposed to spend time preaching to you the law except to study it about uh, what makes it a good thing and so on. But you're not under the law. It's not made for a righteous man, a man who has the righteousness of God. But it is made for the lawless and disobedient. He says, you want to know who that is? Well, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy, profane, murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers. Okay, we get the idea. People who are breaking the law, that you need the law. In other words, we preach the law to the sinner who is condemned by the law. But we don't preach the law to the Christian. He's not under law anymore. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We're to love one another not because you guys are so lovely, but because Jesus loved me. So I want to love you like he loved me. James 2.8 if you fulfill the royal law, what's the royal law? The law of the king, you see. The royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. He says, just remember that, that much of what law keeping is all about and base it on love. Again, Christ reinforced the greatest commandment. Mark 12, 30, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Divide it out, that's everything about you. You love God with all of it. This is the first commandment. Put it all on a love basis. How can I love him more? How can I do what he wants even more? Again, Christ and Paul reinforced the second greatest commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12, 31, Christ said, The second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Paul refers to this in Galatians 5, 13b and 14. By love serve one another. By love, this word serve is, is the work of a slave. 
by love be a slave to one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, one phrase, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. God made us so that we take care of ourselves. Basically, we eat when we're hungry, we sleep when we're tired, and, and uh, we wrap ourselves up when we're cold. You know, you, you know how, how that works. God put that within us, how to, how to love ourselves. We don't have to active, actively try to love ourselves. We do it automatically. But he says, just think of that the way you're treating others. Do you want to be treated the way you're treating others? True worship is not served by law-keeping rituals, but by heart devotion. We say often here, and Pastor Porter was the one who phrased it like this, God is more interested in why you do what you do than he is in what you're doing. The reason you do what you do, good or bad, is more important to God than what you're actually doing. Not law-keeping rituals, but heart devotion. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel says to the, the king who was uh, violating God's word, Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, your rituals, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You disobey God and say it's okay because I'm, I'm doing my rituals? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken to obey is better than the fat of rams, which is what they offered. And let me close with this passage from Isaiah. Isaiah is talking, uh, God is talking through Isaiah to the people of Israel that God during the time of Isaiah is punishing with the Babylonian captivity, the destruction of their home and the sending of them to a foreign land to live under Gentile domination. And listen to what God is saying. He says, you are not loving me. You're just going through rituals. To what purpose, God asked, is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? You think it's a, it's a magic do, deed. You think you're waving some magic ritual wand and everything is okay, saith the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or lambs or of he goats, great goats. When you come to appear or to be seen before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Who asked you to come? He says, you think coming before me in my temple pleases me? He says, you disgust me. You show up and I have to hold my nose. You thought coming to the temple was cleansing you somehow. You just brought dirt and filth into my temple. I am not happy with this. Bring no more vain oblations, sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. Incense is supposed to make it smell wonderful. He says, it stinks. The new moons and the Sabbaths, these are the the dates when they met and so on, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Your rituals that I told you to do out of obedience, you're doing out of sin, and it's just sin. The rituals now are sin. You see, you can come to church, and it's a sin against God because you haven't brought your heart. You can give because it's necessity and God says you're giving me a rotting fish I don't like it it earns you no gold stars it is iniquity even the solemn meeting even the worship service you see so don't bring yourself under the law for giving don't let men do that 
men who actually became, um, <laughs> I put it to the, the fact that they try to get more people in than they can teach. Bring them in faster than they can educate them. Um, once people understand what the Bible says, they're more likely to be able to keep themselves right before God. But if they think it's the coming to church, it's the singing, it's the volunteering to be an usher. Unless it's done out of a heart of devotion. He says, then it's just done out of necessity. It doesn't please me. Don't let your giving go to waste. Give yourself to the Lord, but out of love, not law. Let's pray. Father, we turn our hearts to thee and understand that your hearts, your personal relationship, and love isn't pleased by doing crucial things, chanting some love every message. That's not pleasing to the lover. But share our heart, share our joy, share our money. We be a loving pleasure, and that adds to love. Father, we seek to give unto you our time, our talents, our energy, our, our money for the support of the work here and around the world. We want to give, and we want to show that love. We want your work to be magnified because we love you not because you said we had to do it. With heads bowed, eyes closed, it may be you're saying, I have been giving because somebody told me I had to do that. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Listen to what God says. He says, I don't want you giving out of a sense of necessity. But if you give me a gift because you love me, I love that. If you've been giving them for the wrong motive, perhaps not at all, I ask you for saying, ask for me. I want to be able to please God with what I do with what I do with what I perform for him. For God, please, I love for God. Recognize the gift of love. Pray for me. I want to change what I give. We're giving out of a heart of love. Pray for me. Our Father, we then turn to thee and ask that you might stir us with the love that you showed us by Christ's death for us. Stir us to be involved in this relationship of love. Not doing what we do because we have to do it. That's miracle keeping. That's what religion is based on all around the world. I have this law. You have that law. Everything will work out if you just keep these rituals. And you say it's not, it's not that at all. It's not a law relationship. It's a love relationship. And so, Father, bless us as we turn our hearts to thee and build up the warmth of our heart and love you with a full realization of what you sacrificed for our sake when we could not do anything for ourselves. You allowed your precious son to die for us. Our Father, we ask that you might help us to give as unto thee, but not grudgingly, not of necessity, but to find a cheerfulness of our heart to give unto thee, for you love the cheerful giver. And we pray thy blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.